me give you a big Labor Day surprise. Most people think if we all exercise the same and eat the same, we'd all look the same. And let me tell you why that's wrong. Your body is unique and your metabolism is unique. I'm Lacey Green, and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you can't see me, but I don't look like your average personal trainer. I'm curvy, and I'm proud of it. So I created a program for beginners only on the Body app to show people like us how to get incredible results and be our version of happy and healthy. This isn't just workout videos. It's people like you and me. It's community. It's incredible trainers. It's easy to follow nutrition and mindset experts to help you reduce stress and just feel better. And you can get started with my new program called For Beginners Only. Now, here's the big surprise. If you go to body.com right now, that's B-O-D-I dot com, not only can you get everything Body has to offer at 50% off with an annual membership, you'll also get an additional 20% off, but only during Labor Day weekend. Let's do this together. Go to body.com. That's body with an I dot com. Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 283 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Thursday morning, February 18th, 2021, and just like that, Duke is back on a winning streak. Is the Ewing theory in full effect right now for the Blue Devils? We have to talk about it, and and there is so much to talk about, so I will get right to it. I am your host, Sam Klein. I am here for this episode, joined as always by my colleagues, Donald Wine. Donald, good morning. How are you feeling today, bud? I'm feeling great. There's some sleet going on outside because yet another snowstorm has done, as you know, Sam, done the DC thing. It only brought us sleet, so we're worried about that. But peace to everybody in Texas. Everyone's starting to get their power back, hopefully, uh, and getting out of the cold. But there was some heat going on in Wake last night, and it was coming from our shooting. And and closer to the calamities in Texas, but not exactly there is he's in Georgia. That's Jason Evans. Jason, good morning. Yeah, good morning. I have one of those giddy smiles on my face that I get when Duke is really, really playing well. And it's hard to wipe the smile off my face. I'm quite literally dancing. I'm let's talk about this game. All right. So we'll start, of course, with the headlines. Duke beat Wake Forest last night. It was it was a mashing basically from the end of the first half. Uh, Duke is now nine and eight in overall and, and maybe clawing their way back into tournament consideration. Maybe not. We'll definitely talk about that uh, when we preview the Virginia game, but it's an 84 to 60 victory for the blue devils. I need your guys' headlines before we dive into the good, which is going to take us a long time to get through today. So Jason, start me off with your headline. Devils dominate Deacons behind unstoppable hurt and tenacious D. Uh, this was a multi-pronged beatdown. And Donald, give me, give me your headline from this game. My headline is Duke puts on a hurting and beats the brakes off Wake. I like the, the, the sort of second level punnery that you had in yeah, there. Yeah. I'm just going to go right for it. Ewing theory in full effect for Duke during Wake beatdown. I, and and, and I, I really want to talk about this and, and, and talk about how much the Jalen Johnson being not on this team anymore actually might be. I don't want to put all of the, this team's flaws on Jalen Johnson, but it's certainly playing a factor here. So let's get into all of it. Donald, I'll let you go first. Give me some good points from this game. Maybe you want to start with Matthew Hurt. Maybe you want to start with Jamin Brakefield. Maybe you want to start somewhere else. I want to start somewhere else. I just want to say this. Man, we were active last night. Like we, this team played like they wanted nothing else to be the story other than the fact that they played their asses off, and they and they did that. They they were active all over the floor on offense and defense. Whenever Wake had a chance to kind of make it, where they're like, "Hey, maybe we can get a shot and get get into this." Duke was having none of that. They were not with the play play last night. This is the Duke team that we are used to seeing. They come out. They put their foot on the necks of, of a team that is weaker than them. And they say, hey, you're not getting up. You're not going to you're not going to beat us. This is our game. We have not seen this all year where we've we, very rarely have we seen where it's where this team comes out and is like, you're not winning tonight. This is something that we've seen in previous years. Not so much this year. We saw it last night. And so I was very happy. That's what made this a fun game to watch is that 
every single person was involved. Every single person on offense and defense was doing something to contribute to this game and, and contribute to the victory. So hats off to everybody for stepping up and bringing us a game that made Duke fans everywhere breathe a sigh of relief, but also smile. Hey, hey, Donald, speaking of stepping on their necks, I want to really point out, you know, uh, Wake Forest never led in the entire game. Never led. The game was only tied twice very early on. And Wake never scored. This is worth noting. They never scored more than six points in a row. So not only was Duke stomping them, but once we started stomping them, we never let them really gain momentum and get back into it. And that's what you're talking about in terms of it being a truly dominating performance. It, it was so refreshing. Steve Forbes knew. He knew this was going to be a bad game. That's why he get, That's why he sent himself to the showers really early. He bailed. He bailed. He was right out of there. He was like, and, 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 and I know that he gave some, some fairly generic quote about, you know, just sticking up for Davian Williamson. I think that his, his stated reasoning was that he thought that Williamson was fouled and, and he was just sticking up for his guy. But Steve Forbes wanted none of what Duke was doing to him last night. I, I wanted to, to talk about the shooting, and I, and I know that there's, there's defense to talk about too. But my goodness on the shooting, obviously you start with Matt Hurt, 22 points on nine shots. But we have been waiting for another big Joey Baker game. We've been talking about how there is – I think it's Jason has said repeatedly – there is going to be a game where Joey Baker goes off last night, four for seven from three. I mean, that is exactly the kind of thing that we have been waiting for from Joey Baker all year. And yes, it's against Wake Forest. Wake Forest is not a tournament bound team. This is not the Virginia team that Duke is going to face this weekend, but what a refreshing thing to see, um, to see Joey Baker going four for seven DJ Stewart, 16 points on just 12 shots. That is a great night for a guy that has the ball in his hands a lot. I mean, just up and down the lineup. I, I'm, I'm so impressed with that. And by the way, Jamin Brakefield, uh, not, not shooting a ton, but, but being very effective at both ends of the floor and stepping right into Johnson's role. I, I want to hear a little bit more about individual players. So uh, Donald, talk to me about, about some of the guys on, on the court for Duke. Well, I, like I said, I, I put it in the, in the intro, but Matthew Hurt was amazing. And really anything that he wanted to do, he could. And there was times where he would take the ball and there'd be a guy in his face and he almost looked at the guy as if to say, like, that's cute. You're, you're, you're in my face. This ball is still going in the hoop. It, he's doing that. He's doing that skip to my Lou thing where he's just like, uh -huh. I, don't, I don't need to bother with you. Yeah, I don't see I don't see broke uh, right now. I'm getting this cash. That's what he was doing last night. It was it was fun to see that, too, because th there was a point we were having fun as fans but you could tell they were having fun as players. And in this stressful year, you know, we've always wanted that from the team. If anything, Hey, go out there and play and have fun. Like, yes, it's a game. Yes. We're trying to win. We want you to be competitive, but have some fun while you're doing it. These guys had a lot of fun. And I think that settled everyone down really early. Like you said, you know, six points in, you know, it was tied back and forth. And then, Wake just never got momentum, but I will say this about the, the, the whole entire team. And, and I know we were talking about individual players. They all were playing well together. The ball movement was incredible. The only, like one of the very few negatives that I have is that we had 17 assists on 33 made baskets. Now the only reason that percentage is off is because we made 33 shots. So that's a great thing. We want to see that ball movement. And really, the guys were finding each other. They were getting each other involved. And if there was a guy on the court that wasn't involved, they were making sure that the ball was getting into their hands so that they could be a part of this game. So the ball movement is a huge, huge story from this game. And it, it wasn't just that we were creating baskets with the ball movement. Obviously, that's the ultimate goal of the offense. And, and the 17 assists is a huge number for Duke but it was also that we protected the ball. So Duke had three turnovers on our first four possessions. Oh my gosh. We only had three turnovers the rest of the game. At one point, Duke went 25 minutes of game time without making a single turnover. That's absurd. That's ridiculous. As a result, Wake Forest scored a grand total of two points off turnover. I'm going to repeat that. Wake scored two points off turnover. No wonder Wake Forest did not score in this game. No wonder they struggled to get to 60. They could not get easy baskets because we were not giving them the ball in, a, in an advantageous position, in an advantageous situation. And by the way, Duke was making aggressive passes. Like it wasn't, it wasn't that Duke was yes. playing conservatively. 
Duke ended the scores over 80 points in this game. That was not a particularly fast paced game, but they moved the ball so efficiently and found the extra pass, not just around the perimeter, but going inside to Mark Williams and going inside to Matthew Hurt. There was a lot of driving kick going on and, and there were a couple times where they found the extra man. There's one play that stands out for me from the first half where Matthew Hurt has a guy in his face and he's receiving the pass, thinks for like just half a moment about taking the shot and then and then continues the pass on to DJ Stewart, who's wide open. And look, Matthew Hurt's the best shooter on the team. Normally you'd say, Matthew Hurt, take the shot if you're vaguely open. But he was like, no. We're going we're gonna to keep this going. I'm going to get other guys involved. I, he knows that he wants DJ Stewart to, be, to also be an effective shooter. So get him the ball, get that confidence, and boom. That, is, like, it, that kind of thing was happening all night for Duke. And, and there was that play at the very end of the first half where Hurt gets the ball in the corner. They came out to him. He passed out. I think it was Stewart or Roach. I forget who it was. He passed out. The guy who was guarding him then chases the ball as he's supposed to because he's been burned by Matthew Hurt passing the ball. The ball then comes right back to Hurt. He is wide open for a corner three. Nothing but the bottom of the net on it. It was, a, it was an absolute backbreaker of a play because I think Wake thought maybe we can get this down to 10 at the end of the first half. No chance. And – it's almost, guys, it is almost like with this passing and sharing and knowing where their teammates are supposed to be, it's almost like maybe it takes young players a little while to start to learn how to play together or something crazy like that. I know that's a wacky notion. but Where would you get an idea like that? And, <laughs> and, and, just, and how could just... that possibly be manifesting on this team in this season? Just out of left field, Jason. But but really, when it comes to all this, it, it goes back to another thing that we haven't seen a lot of all year. We were making open shots. You know, how, how lovely is it when you see a shot and it goes in? There was only a few times where we had guys in our faces, or and, and there was only a couple of times where we had heat checks. And those heat checks went in. Like, I think there was one where, where Wendell Moore was like, ah, let me try one. I haven't made a three yet. Bam, goes in. Matthew Hurt had one where he's like, oh, there's a guy like literally two inches from my face. I want to see if I'm really on. And he, as soon as he jumped and released it, you could tell he kind of run, starts running back down the court like, well, this is the problem because these, these are going in. If these are going in, you shouldn't leave us open. And, oh, wait. DJ Stewart's left over. Oh, wait, Jeremy Roach left open. All of these guys, the, the confidence that they got from the early going with some of these heat checks really blossomed throughout the game. Donald, Joey Baker had a heat check late in the game or, you know, uh-huh. like about seven or eight minutes left that got blocked. Uh, like it, it, you know, it yeah. ended up coming up like five feet short of the basket. But I was like, that was, that was Joey's heat check after he'd hit a that's few. The only, that's the only heat check that missed. It was, right, but, right. It was, but even then he came back down like, what, three possessions later and hit another three to get to his third three of the night. So, so I want to I talk about a few of the individual players because that's what we're supposed to be focusing on here. <laughs> um, and, and I'm going to start with Jamin Brakefield. To me, Brakefield's performance, this, I, I, look, everyone's keying on Brakefield. Everyone's going to pay attention to him because – he is the guy with, with uh, Jalen Johnson not playing, with Jalen Johnson opting out. He is the guy that's going to get a lot of Jalen's minutes. And so everyone's wanting to see what's he going to do. Uh, and I, it, it almost felt sort of different from the very start for him. I, I, I want to recall the first couple plays when he was in were, were rebounds. It was, it was rebounds that came his direction. And he... And both times, the ball bounced on the floor in front of him, which ordinarily would be like, what's going on? Why is he not grabbing it in the air? It bounced on the floor because he was boxing his man out so effectively, moving his man away from the basket that the ball was able to land right in front of him. There was no way to contest the rebound because he boxed out his man so effectively. Uh, That seems like a weird thing, but that's a very fundamental thing that he was doing. And rebounding has been a problem for Jamin Brakefield all season long. It was not a problem in this game. And it, almost because of the awareness that he showed on those rebounds, it translated to the offense. He was draining threes, taking guys off the dribble. Oh, my gosh, he was taking guys off the dribble. He, and, and you could just tell he felt confident. He attempted a, a behind-the-back pass at one point. That, that actually worked out. The guy ended up getting fouled. I think it was to Mark Williams and Williams ended up getting fouled, but it was a really nice, very aware pass. And that, that tomahawk down the lane, it, he got fouled. He didn't make it, but that was like a ridiculously athletic attempted tomahawk dunk. I was out of my chair and you know, I don't want to be mean to Jalen Johnson, but I was like screaming Jalen who, 
because that was a sick play on a scale of one to 10 for confidence. Jamin Brakefield's confidence right now is at a 17. That dude is like, he is ready to play. It, it, and it's great to see. Hey, I was about to burn. I was about to burn this place down. If he had made that dunk, uh, that he, the, the dunk attempt that he had, uh, where he just missed it and just bounced off the road right before he went to TV timeout. Whew, boy, I would have been out in these streets in DC. You would have seen me yelling about that one. Cause that one, it would, had that, that one almost was awesome. It had that, that Jason Tatum kind of look to it. Oh yeah. Like he, he was ready to, to, to just, Turn it all the way up. Well, he I, jumped. He jumped from like he jumped from like midway through the lane, and it was like, oh, he's going up for a nice, nice floater to see if he can, you know, get it over. Nope. He's nope. like, no, I chose violence today, and the violence is going to be taken on the rim. It was great. Those are the, that's the confidence we want to see from these guys. And then the other guy who's getting the minutes because of Jalen Johnson, you know, not being on the team anymore, is Mark Williams. And oh my lordy, I mean, Mark Williams' first half. Mark Williams is sort of like. He's like a Christmas present that, you know, where you keep on opening the box and there's another box underneath it. You keep on unveiling new parts of his game, something that hadn't been there before. He had this little reverse lefty power layup through contact in the first half that was just a revelation. I got this giddy grin on my face watching him. Sam, you said it a couple podcasts ago. If we get a junior year Mark Williams, if he lasts at Duke until his junior season, which is suddenly not a sure thing anymore. That dude is going to own the NCAA. He is a force in the paint. He is going to be a huge part of every team's game plan. You must be aware when Mark Williams is in the game on offense and defense now. On defense, you know, in terms of when Duke's on defense, because he's blocking shots at a ridiculous rate. But on offense, he is incredibly confident. He, 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 he's showing post moves around the basket. He can finish. He's a difference maker. He continues to be a difference maker. And I think one of the major reasons that Duke is playing better now than we were earlier is the emergence of Mark Williams. I wanted to look at Wake Forest's performance in this game as another positive for Duke in that the combination of Williamson, Witt, and Mucius for Wake, who I think are their three most effective offensive players normally, went eight for 22 last night and scored just 23 points. That is effective team defense that, that shows up for them taking bad shots, not making those shots and, and Duke being able to, to convert those into, you know, their bad possessions that turned into turnovers or their Duke defensive rebounds that went the other way. There were no players on Wake Forest last night that had particularly good games against Duke. And I think that's a testament to the team coming together Donald, tell me more about Duke's defensive effort last night and what you saw from this team and what we might be able to carry forward to a game this weekend against a particularly high-profile opponent. Well, that activity that I mentioned that we had was on both ends of the floor, and I want to zero in on one particular stat that I've been keeping track of the last few games uh, that I mentioned last episode, uh, and this, it proved to be sort of telling for this game, is points in the paint. And... Before this, I think over the last five or six games, we had allowed an average of 40 points in the paint per game. And in this game against Wake Forest, we only allowed 26. We actually outscored them in the paint 34 to 26. So when you subtract 14 points, that is a really big deal, especially given that, you know, given that we won uh, by over 20 points. But then you factor in the three point shooting and their perimeter shooting was uh, was just awful, too. And. Of course, that's not going to tie in every single game. There have been times where we have seen our team play well on defense on the inside, but the other other team is just banging them from outside. They were not doing that. Wake Forest was only 28% from three-point land. So couple those two things together, an improvement on defense in the paint. They weren't making their outside shots. That defense has still been there. That led to a lot of competition. And really for Duke, we had a lot of one and outs where – they would miss the shot. We would get the rebound and go the other way. There was very few times that Wake Forest was able to get second chance points. And really because of that, anytime they wanted to mount any sort of comeback or any sort of momentum boost, they didn't have it. And that's, that's where the defense really succeeded. And, and I'll tell you, the, the thing about the defense that I noticed was we were rotating better. We were helping better. Um, it, it is clear that this is a team that has learned what it needs to do on defense. Coach K in the postgame news conference talked about the fact that they have put in a, a, a change about a week or two ago in how they defend ball screens. 
Um, he said they've, they've made it so that it better suits our personnel. I'm not sure if he's talking about something that the guards need to do differently or the forwards need to do differently. But this team is defending ball screens differently, defending them way better. My goodness. We were getting killed on ball screens all season long, and things have changed. Now, it's going to be interesting to see if we keep that up playing better opponents because we've got some good opponents coming up. Duke's going to have to play well against those teams. This, this change in ball screen that we've made is going to have to work against them. Otherwise, the season is toast. But we had Wake flustered. They were making bad turnovers. They were taking bad shots. We were getting back and not letting them get fast break points. And our help defense, our rotations are so much better that it just feels like the game has slowed down for this Duke team, that we're relaxed. We sort of know what we're doing now. We're reacting and, and not thinking. And as a result, you know, things like getting back on defense um, and, and uh, you know, trapping the guy who, who's in a bad situation has become second nature to them. Uh, and, and that's the hallmark of a good defensive team. And that's what we're becoming. I wanted to wrap up the good here with a nod to Coach K and the John Thompson towel that, that he was wearing last night. I think this was a National Association of Basketball Coaches uh, thing that was going on. So this was certainly not unique to Coach K, but a very cool nod to John Thompson and an awesome um, an, an awesome tribute there that, that was really good to see. Guys, I guess we have to talk bad. To the extent that there was bad, uh, let me hear it. I, I Hopefully there isn't too much in a game that Duke wins by 24. But Jason, I'll come to you first. Tell me something that you didn't like from Duke that needs to be improved quickly. There are a couple bad things. The first one, most important one is, why hasn't Duke played like this all year? <laughs> okay, in a serious way. Um, Wendell Moore, uh, who had a pretty good game, uh, was forcing in the first half. He committed four of Duke's six turnovers, um, had a couple early turnovers. Uh, you know, you'd like to see him be a little more under control. I don't like when he jumps in the air and hasn't decided what he's going to do with the ball yet. That's, that's a dangerous situation, and he, he put himself in that situation a little bit. Um, and the only other bad I had, Matthew Hurt is shooting so well, it's getting harder and harder to see how the NCAA, I'm sorry, the NBA doesn't come calling for him. Uh, so <laughs> it seems crazy to say that's a bad, but if you had hopes that Matthew Hurt might come back to Duke, he is shooting his way into the first round. I talked about how Duke was able to hold Wake's most impressive offensive players down last night and, and that that was a team success across the board. I mentioned in the preview for this game that one of the Wake players that was playing better in recent weeks was Odie Oguama, who I, whose name I believe I mispronounced in the preview, so I'm sorry to him for that. But uh, Oguama was – he didn't play a ton of minutes last night, like just under 20 minutes, but was very effective on offense. And when we talk about the development of Mark Williams, being able to hold down a player like Oguama is going to be – part of Mark Williams' development. He's going to have his hands full with Virginia big men this weekend, so he's got another shot at it. But Oguama had a, had a pretty effective game in the paint against Duke, and I think that there's an opportunity for Duke to get even better at defending, especially in the interior, uh, in games going forward. So that, that was, I think, the, the room for improvement. The other thing that I'm kind of disappointed by this season is how little we've seen of Patrick Tepay. He did get a few minutes last night. And I know he'll get another opportunity next year to come back, given the situation with the pandemic and the extra year afforded to players. But I'm personally, I'm just a little bummed that that he made the whole effort of transferring to Duke and, and being a part of the program and that he hasn't contributed a ton this year. So hopefully next year we see a little more of him. It's crowded in the paint for Duke with with Mark Williams and then with recruits coming in. But maybe there will there will be time that, that Patrick to will will carve out. Donald, any other negatives from this game that you wanted to highlight? Uh, I just wanted to highlight on the free throw shooting. I know we we like to ha harp on that because it's been a stat of note of, uh, lately. Uh, they went seven for 13 last night. There's one area that I you know will say like, hmm, I wonder if things could go differently. And it was when Steve Forbes got uh, tossed from the game. He got two consecutive uh, technical fouls uh, in a row during a timeout. We don't really know how that transpired. It occurred while we were in a commercial break. But when we came back, we saw Matthew Hurt attempt four free throws. He made two of them. And not to say that Matthew Hurt is a, a terrible free throw shooter, but we had the best free throw shooter on the floor, and his name is DJ Stewart. And I'm wondering why DJ Stewart didn't take those four free throws uh, because 
you know, if he's shooting 85, 86%, chances are he's going to make those four. Um, and it's not to say that that was something can, uh, that was something that would, could have affected the game, but in a close game, you need to make your free throws and you want to make sure that if you have opportunities where you can get free points, you have the guys at the line that can get those free points uh, without you having to really sweat a little bit. So uh, that's the only really thing I saw from it. And also I will note uh, that only four guys were in double figures and it should have been five. Uh, Mark Williams, I think needs to do a little bit better uh, than his three for five performance so that he can get above 10 points and, and make it so that we can have five, because I, I think having more people in double figures means we have scored more points. And I think that is a good thing. So, so just to recap, <clears throat> Donald's bad is that Duke left two points at the free throw line on technical fouls in a game. We won by 24 points and we had six guys score seven or more points, but Donald wants to, us to get more guys in double figures. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, to be it, fair, that's to be fair, bad, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> to be fair, I did say the free throw shooting was seven for 13. So that's yeah. a little, little 50 cents. We want, let, let's get that up a little bit, but they did get to the line a little bit more. Uh, but we want to see that go up too. If they're, if they're going to be doing all this stuff, I, I feel like I, I want it where we, we make, you know, 70% of our shots, uh, 50% from three and all those that we missed, we got fouled and we make those free throws. So, I mean, we can aim for perfection. We're just not there yet. So guys, that'll do it for our recap of the Wake Forest game, which I think we're all appropriately giddy over. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will share the latest, which is not much, on the Jalen Johnson situation. And we'll preview Duke's huge game this weekend against Virginia. Definitely their best opponent left on the schedule and an an enormous opportunity for Duke to maybe claw back into NCAA tournament consideration. Stick around. All right, we're back. And before we preview Duke's game against Virginia this weekend, wanted to touch just very quickly on Jalen Johnson, who was discussed a little bit in the post-game press conference last night. And of course, every college basketball talking head has been all over the situation. So let's just give some, some updated facts and thoughts on the situation before we move on. Jason, I'll give it to you first. You were in the post-game presser last night. What were Coach K and the other players saying about Jalen Johnson? So there was a unanimous opinion about Jalen Johnson from the three folks who appeared in the postgame news conference, Coach K, DJ Stewart, and Matthew Hurt. All three of them were very, very clear. The team loves Jalen. The, the team supports everything that Jalen's doing. They understand it. They are not upset at all. Um, I, I don't know if they'd been necessarily prepped about what they were supposed to say, but, but they all sounded the exact same line. Both DJ and Matthew Hurt said, Jalen's my boy. You know, uh, you know, I love the dude. I'm still texting and talking to him. Uh, you know, we wish him all the best. We totally understand his decision. Coach K went a little bit further. Coach K said, you know, look, uh, we spoke to his family. Uh, Coach K said, I'm a coach because of players. And these kids should be allowed to make whatever choice they want. And I'm 100% behind him. Um, uh, and Coach K pointed out that with the pandemic, that the team really have themselves, that they are a family, that they haven't made friends outside of their teammates. And so, you know, they feel really, really close and they're going to miss Jalen for sure, both, you know, as a teammate and as a friend, but they all support and understand what he's doing. Um, so I, I would describe their comments as not terribly revealing. I actually asked one of the players if, if it had been a surprise, you know, if they'd heard, um, if, if Jalen had told them himself um, and, and they said that they, they hadn't heard from Jalen, they'd heard it from Coach K, but it, it wasn't a huge surprise. I get the feeling that they sort of maybe sensed or, or knew that he was thinking about this um, in terms of Jalen thinking about, you know, going off to focus exclusively on the NBA draft. And the last thing I want to add about all of this is there, there are a number of articles out there talking about what NBA scouts are saying, because Jalen has, has chosen to focus on preparing for the NBA draft. That's the reason he, he left the Duke team. And the scouts are saying that there are some big questions now about him, that this could hurt his stock. 
um, especially when you, when you combine the decision here with the decision he made last year in high school to leave IMG Academy and leave that team. Scouts are saying that maybe this is a guy who, when the going gets tough and the competition gets good, he doesn't have the intestinal fortitude to, to stick it out. Maybe this is a guy who has trouble making a commitment to a team. Uh, you know, this kind of stuff combined with some of the questions about the quality of his play over the past few weeks there's now talk that Jalen Johnson, who was a for sure lottery pick, could be finding his way into the mid, maybe late first round kind of area. And he has questions to answer. When NBA teams are interviewing him, he will have questions to answer about what happened at Duke. I, don't, I want to be clear. I'm not criticizing him. I'm not saying he made a poor decision. Um, I understand why he made the decision. But this does raise more questions about Jalen Johnson and and it could end up impacting his his NBA future. I think when it comes to Jalen Johnson, there, there's a lot of things that we can speculate on. I know, you know, you kind of looked at some of the analysts and what they're doing. That's not speculation in my mind. I did want to touch on something that I think was important in it uh, when we were reading through the the forums, uh, which everyone should check out. The the conversation is robust there uh, these days about this. Uh, but Stray Gator. Um, one of our one of our moderators, he chimed in with something that I think is important. And I think people were asking, you know, why wouldn't he just say, hey, I'm not going to play the rest of the year and just remain on the team instead of just completely opting out? Well, as we all know, Duke has a very strict COVID policy uh, with regards to anyone who is participating in intercollegiate athletics. And for a guy who is not going to be playing, if, if you know, we're saying, hey, he's hurt, he's not going to be playing the rest of the year, he needs to rest. But him being on the bench meant that he would have to still adhere to those COVID protocols and he would still have to ISO for, you know, and, and do all the things that they've been doing since August uh, to make sure that they're able to play basketball. And when you're not playing basketball, that means you know, even you know, you're going to be going and doing all this stuff and going to practices and everything, and you're not going to be playing so why subject yourself to those protocols? Why can't you just remove yourself from that? Also freeing up, uh, freeing up the, the team that they don't have to worry about you going to you know, do workouts or do tra- therapy or anything that you needed to do to start preparing for the draft. So I think that was a very interesting note that I wanted to point out about this because I think that's something that's being overlooked when we consider the to- totality of all of this. Well, I, I want to be clear. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have a pretty good idea of what Jalen Johnson is doing. He is going to hire professional. There, there are guys out there who prepare you for the draft who are professional trainers, professional coaches. He is going to hire folks like that, which he could not do if he was staying in the Duke COVID protocols. And he's going to go off and he is going to work with those folks to get himself as ready for the draft as possible. When someone says I'm leaving the team to prepare for the draft, that doesn't mean I'm not playing anymore. In fact, what it means is the only thing I'm doing is I'm working on the skills the NBA needs to see from me. And I'm working with professional coaches on that. And Jalen could not do that and stay on the Duke team. So the option, like Donald said, of staying on the bench and being a part of the team and not playing, that's not there for him. That, that doesn't work with what he is attempting to accomplish. He is attempting to put himself in the best possible position to succeed in the NBA. And, and I don't blame him for it. I understand it, even, even though we're disappointed by it, because we'd love to see him play more in a Duke uniform. I would echo that disappointment. And, and I'll just add that I mentioned at the top of this discussion that there's been a lot of commentary, I guess, from you know everyone like us on the internet and everyone who is a real professional basketball commentator, college basketball analyst is talking about this because it's a huge story. It's Duke's top recruit from this year opting out of the season after, you know, years of Duke having players like Jalen Johnson or players who are even better than Jalen Johnson, who have even more brightly projected futures than Jalen Johnson, choosing to stick it out on the team through whatever adversity comes along. Zion Williamson's injury, I think, being the most recent example of that. And Zion saying, no, I'm sticking it out. I'm, I'm coming back. I need to play for the team, et cetera. And, and I think what we're missing here, and I, I said this last time too during our emergency podcast, but I think it bears repeating, is we don't really know what's going on here. We know that, you know, that there was that rumbling from Jeff Goodman about the issues between Jalen's camp, quote unquote, and, and Duke dating back some time, speculation about his time at IMG from when he was in high school, we don't know all the facts here. We don't know what's going on, but 
we can hear what coach K and, and, and the team and his teammates are saying. And Jason, I think you said that, you know, maybe they were coached on how to talk about it or whatever. DJ Stewart seems like a, seems like a great kid. He's whatever. He's 18, 19 years old. Uh, he seems like a great dude and someone that like I would be friends with if I was his age and, and was going to school with him. He does not seem like someone that is just going to lie to everybody about, you know, coach K is, is experienced with yep. all this PR stuff and, and all that, but but no one is asking DJ Stewart to, you know, say all these right things. Like you have to talk this way about, about your teammate who just left the team. It, it seems genuine. And it seems like all these guys are still getting along. And for some reason that we don't totally understand, it makes sense for Jalen to not be part of the team anymore. And unless we knew way more about the situation and all the characters involved, because by the way, there are probably characters here that we have never met that we have never seen on camera that are not in Duke uniforms that are not associated with, with, with Duke university in any way. And we don't know who they are. We don't know all the facts. So I'd rather us all kind of step back and stop trying to, you know, assign blame to this or, or cast aspersions on, on Jalen or on members of the program or whoever, because we don't really know. It's the same thing, you know, going back years when we started this podcast, the first like big news thing that happened was the Rashid Suleiman situation where he was um, where he was kicked off the team and he transferred to Maryland and all that. And I think the same thing happened back in the day when we were talking about it, we, we were trying to say, look, we don't know all the facts. There's a lot of really nasty rumors about what Suleiman did and, and, and why he's not on the team anymore, but we never got them clear. So it's not fair for us to be, to be commenting on it. So I, I just want to echo the same kind of call for um, for a little bit of, of grace as we're as we're discussing all of this because again it's all happening in the midst of the pandemic and and I can't fault anybody for making decisions that are best for their health and family right now when everything is so challenging. I mean, you mentioned the design, you know, blowing through his shoe a couple of years ago, and if you guys remember this on the boards we had a it was a heated discussion about whether he should stick it out or he should call it a season when that happened. And most people were like, Hey, no harm, man. Go, like go get your money. You blew through, you literally blew through a shoe. Don't, don't sacrifice your millions for us. Like go ahead, sit the rest of the season out. And naturally he, he was like, Hey, I'll come back. I'm ready to go. And we all think, you know, that was great. We were able to get, you know, what, seven more games of Zion Williamson in a and, and uniform and before. Let's, let's be clear. Zion said it was never a consideration. Right. It was more, it was everyone else talking about it. Yeah. He said this was never a consideration for him. And I think that's true of most guys. Right. So I think it's unfair to, to, to think back then that it was cool if Zion Williamson just kind of called the season. And then this time around a player decides to do just that because of injury, because he wants to prepare for the draft. He wants to be as healthy as possible that all of a sudden it's become a a thing. And, And I think it's probably because of, the pattern that that you alluded to, Jason and, and, and Sam, with what happened in, in high school, but I, I think it is still unfair that we are quick to dismiss and and, and forgive Zion Williamson for even thinking about it, even though he wasn't, and then bl- assign blame to Jalen for doing what we were going to allow probably the best player we've seen in a generation do two years ago. We don't know all the facts, and and we won't. Probably like we won't know them in the short term. We never it's will. Very possible. We don't know. We won't know these things in the long term. So this, I think this is the best we can do. And, and, and we don't want to be unfair to anybody. We're, we're unfair enough by being overt Duke partisans <laughs> talking about all these games <laughs> and, and having as much fun as we do. So let's let's try to be nice to everyone. So I hope hope everyone's nice. Speaking of nice, the Virginia Cavaliers are a nice basketball team. They have been well, most recently they they got the doors blown off of them by Florida state. But prior to that, everything has been on the up and up for Virginia. They have had a great season. Duke plays them this weekend. It is Duke's best opportunity to, to put a point on its resume towards potentially making the NCAA tournament, which right now seems like a long shot, but will not seem like a long shot if Duke is able to pull off this upset this weekend. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the Virginia Cavaliers. Donald, I'm going to come to you first because I want you to walk me through the last few weeks of Virginia basketball, because they have shown some vulnerabilities I mentioned against Florida state. So what have we seen recently for Virginia that might indicate that Duke is able to pull off the upset? 
So since this is the first time we we will have seen, and the only time we will see Virginia, unless we see them in the ACC tournament uh, or maybe the NCAA tournament, uh, let me back up a little bit and just talk about them overall. They're fifteen and four on the season. They're eleven and two, and, and as you mentioned, they've been consistently one of the top ten teams in basketball this year. They didn't start out that way. They got off to a rough start. They lost to San Francisco in their second game of the year. And then like a couple, like a week and a half later, they got pummeled by Gonzaga. But I, I'm dismissing that. Gonzaga's are, are they're world beaters. So there's no shame in losing to Gonzaga. But in the ACC, they have been very consistent at beating teams by about 10 to 12 points. They, they're a team that will wear you down. Their pack line defense is going to make sure that you don't get a lot of shots off. You don't get a lot of points. And they're going to, they're going to win by an average of like 62 to 50. Like that's basically what most of their games are. They have had a couple of blowouts. They beat Clemson by 35 back in January, and they also beat Syracuse by 23. But other than that, you have games where they've won by eight, 10, 12, 11, nine. Like they're, they're just very consistent at your it's a Virginia game is very consistent. You know exactly what you're going to get and you can almost peg what the score is going to be if they're going to emerge on top. They have two losses in the ACC, as I mentioned. Uh, you mentioned they just got dusted by Florida State by 21 points on the road. That one didn't feel close. They lost by uh, 14 to Virginia Tech back on January 30th. That was at uh, Blacksburg. But in this game against Florida State, one thing that was very apparent in everything, they they shot the ball dis, you know, decently well. From three, they were a little less normal, a uh, little less than normal. But it was turnovers. Turnovers, they had 13. Florida State only had five. And in a defense that allows you uh, the opportunity to just take bad shots, they're not trying to steal the ball. They're not trying to make you turn the ball over. They're just trying to make you have a bad offensive possession. Florida State had very few of them. And when you had, and, and if they were shooting, if we are shooting the way we did last night, that's going to pose some problems for Virgi- for Virginia because they are not prone to try and taking the ball from you. They're just trying to make you get, they're trying to get in your face, make you take a shot with one or two seconds left on the shot clock and waste an opportunity while they go down and do the same and, and put in points on the other end. And they pick and choose when they put that in there. But for us, and really their downfall over the last few years of this pack line offense is if you can score and you can have a good shooting night, the pack line defense doesn't matter. And we've had some of those opportunities against Virginia. We've taken advantage of them. This is one where, as you mentioned, it's the biggest game of the year. It is at home in Cameron. We have to come out shooting and put Virginia on their heels because if we can do that, then the pack line defense starts to fray, you know, fray a little bit. But if we can, if we make it where they're allowed to establish that and make it where we're getting bad shots off and we're turning the ball over and we're handing the ball to them, this is going to be something that Virginia Tech is going to really want us to do. It's going to play right into their hands. It's amazing to me that every year consistently with Tony Bennett's teams, they always, like, regardless of, of, of who's on the floor for them, they are always going to play slow. They are always going to play deliberately. And therefore, they may occasionally be prone to teams that have a really good shooting night. Jason, can you talk me through some of the advanced analytics on Virginia? I said, always slow. That is a hallmark for this program under Tony Bennett. But what else do we see in the metrics that that maybe could cause holes for them? So I'm going to tell you something fascinating about this Virginia team, which is, yeah, you're right. They play slowest molasses, slowest pace in all of Division I. You're going to get about 10 fewer possessions per game against Virginia than in an average NCAA game. And, and you may think, oh, 10, that's, 10 is a lot. That's a lot. They're only like 65 possessions in an NCAA tournament game. So only getting 55 versus 65, that makes a huge difference in the final score. But here's the thing I want to tell you about Virginia. This is not the same UVA team we've seen in recent years. This team is number 23 in the nation on defense. That's very good. Look, they're a great defensive team. But the last time UVA wasn't one of the top 10 defenses in the country was 2013 almost a decade ago. They have made a hallmark out of being a team that is super great defensive efficiency. And they're good. They're very good at it this year, but they're not as good as they have been in the past. And the other difference is, this is actually a good offensive team. Look, a year ago, we saw this UVA team was great on defense, 
terrible on offense. This team is actually better on offense than they are on defense. I said they're 23rd on defense. They're 14th on offense. And this UVA team is actually a really, really good shooting team. The way they beat you, yes, they slow you down. Yes, they make it hard for you to score. They shoot over you. They're great from three. They hit almost 40% of their three-pointers. The seventh best three-point shooting team in the country, and they take a lot of threes. And you know what? They're not too bad at twos either. They hit 55% of their two-point shots. That translates to be the fifth best effective field goal percentage in the land. When this Virginia team shoots the ball, they tend to score. So that's a huge deal. They are also incredibly careful. They're among the top 10 teams in the country at not turning the ball over. And do not put them on the free throw line. Goodness gracious. Virginia hits 79% of their free throws. One of the best free throw shooting teams in the country. The only thing they don't do well on offense is rebound. 321st in the country at offensive rebounding. The thing about their defense, the pack line is it forces you to take bad shots, but they don't force a lot of turnovers and they don't, and they, and they rebound really well. So the pack line, because it's playing back close to the basket, you can shoot over it, but you can't penetrate it to get easy shots and you can't get rebounds against them. So the, so this weird thing is they don't get offensive rebounds, but they get a ton of defensive rebounds and they protect the rim really well. They're a top 40 uh, shot blocking team. Um, One last thing I wanted to mention about them in terms of the analytics They don't use their bench. Their bench only accounts for 22% of their minutes played, which is one of the uh, lowest numbers in the nation, 325th in the nation in bench bench usage. Most teams in the NCAA use their bench more than 30% of the time. Virginia, only 22%. So if you get them into a little bit faster paced game, maybe that that becomes a factor for them, but good luck getting Virginia into a fast paced game. I think that's almost impossible to do. Jason, I'm glad you brought up the bench because I was going to say, you know, normally when I preview some of the players from the team, I'll tell you about a few starters and then maybe some reserves to look out for. Not really the case with Virginia. I'm going to focus entirely on the guys we expect to start. It's it's the same group. It's been the same group for a while. And, and those are the guys that make most of the impact for Virginia. Unfortunately for Duke, those guys, overwhelmingly pretty good basketball players. And I'm going to start with Sam Hauser who is a senior transfer. He actually played for, for Steve Wojciechowski, our, our former Duke player and Duke assistant. He was Wojo's player at Marquette. He and his twin brother were both there, and, and the Hausers both transferred away from Wojo's team. So Sam Hauser is now the, the, the kind of star of, of UVA this year. He's a, like I said, he's a senior. He's a big guy, 6'8", 218, and oh boy, can he shoot the basketball. He is a great shooter. He also gobbles up a ton of rebounds for Virginia from the pack line defense. So Sam Hauser's a guy that, that Duke is going to have to be careful with. I assume that Matthew Hurt's going to be guarding him, and that is going to be a challenge for Matthew Hurt, but the Sam Hauser versus Matthew Hurt offensive back and forth, I think is going to be really fun to watch. I, I hope, by the way, going into this game, that Duke is able to keep this competitive and and maybe eke out the win. But I think there are going to be a lot of fun matchups on the floor. And so I'll, I'll kind of preview a few of those. Real quick on Sam Hauser. Uh, I, I know you were mentioning him. This will be the second Hauser brother that we faced this year. We faced Joey, uh, who transferred to Michigan State. And remember, those two were actually supposed to play each other in the ACC Big Ten Challenge, but it had been canceled uh, due to COVID. So uh, I do think that we can take a look at that game to kind of see. They have, I mean, they're not totally different, but they do have some similar traits in their game. And I think Matthew Hurt can look to that game as kind of a way of how to play uh, Sam Hauser uh, on Saturday. There are two guys who are going to stand out for Duke fans, Kihei Clark and Jay Huff, who have both been key contributors for this UVA team. They were both on the national championship team a couple of years ago. Kihei Clark, of course, being the point guard, he's a little guy. I think he's only like 5'9", 5'10", but very effective, uh, plays you know basically every minute for UVA. The, the key with Kihei Clark is that he's, he's good, not great at holding on to the basketball. Jason mentioned that UVA doesn't turn the ball over a lot. The one guy that you can kind of force into turnovers is Kihei Clark. So I want to see what DJ Stewart and maybe Jeremy Roach do to him on defense, because that's going to be maybe one of the keys for Duke is if you can turn Clark over four or five times, that could turn into something. I think Jordan Goldwater is going to be a huge, huge factor on him. Um, I expect 
you know, when Goldbar is probably going to play, you know, around 25 minutes, that's what he's been playing a lot lately. Um, I expect he will be on Kihei Clark that whole time. Kihei Clark is the engine that drives this Virginia offense. The other guys are the shooters. The other guys are making the baskets, but Kihei Clark is the, you know, the ignition that gets it all started. He plays the hardest, the toughest of anybody on that team. And it will be Jordan Goldwire's job to make things difficult for him. If things are difficult for Kihei Clark, Virginia will be in trouble. The last sort of most prominent member of this team that I think Duke fans are all familiar with is Durham native Jay Huff, who has made it his business to just be amazing against Duke in years past. And, <laughs> and I expect it will be no different this weekend. Jay Huff always gets excited to play teams from the triangle. He's, he's from the area. So this is, this is certainly on his radar. And the scary thing about Jay Huff is that he's a seven footer who just drains baskets outside, inside, free throw line, you name it, Jay Huff gets buckets. He is a dude, by the way, if Duke had had recruited Jay Huff, I can't even imagine how much other programs would hate a, a Jay Huff in a Duke uniform. So that is going to be, I think, the toughest matchup for Duke. Like as tough as Sam Hauser is, Duke has a Matthew Hurt going against him. Mark Williams, as good as he's played, I do not think is is ready for the the hurt that that Jay Huff is going to put on him. Uh, yeah. And, and that is one of the most important matchups, if not the most important matchup in this, in this upcoming game, uh, Jay Huff, as you mentioned, he's hitting almost 45% of his threes and he's taking a lot. Like lately he started taking more and more of them. Like you can't find a game where he doesn't take three, four, five, six, three pointers in our past game. Um, uh, both, both against NC state and against wake, but especially you noticed it against wake forest, the scouting report, Mark Williams was able to stay back in the lane when uh, 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 Ogichi Oganwu, I, I can't pronounce the guy's name. I'm sorry. Oganwu, when he was, when he got the ball outside, Mark Williams was a good 10 feet away from him because he knew he was not going to shoot from the perimeter. Oganwu hasn't attempted a single three pointer all year. So Mark Williams stayed back and was able to help defense in the lane when Oganwu went outside. Mark Williams will not be able to do that against Jay Huff. You have to follow Jay Huff to the perimeter or he will shoot threes over you. And I got bad news for you, Mark Williams. Jay Huff will, if you follow him out there, he will put the ball on the floor and try and yam on you in the lane. Go around you and just slam dunk Duke's life out. Jay Huff is a problem and, and it is going to be Mark Williams, perhaps his most difficult challenge yet, guarding a guy who is going to put him in uncomfortable situations. I want to push back on that because uh, honestly, I want to put this whole game under protest because I, I'm pretty sure that two years ago, Zion retired Jay Huff. Like he 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 dunked he dunked him into retirement, and <laughs> that man is still playing. So I, I call I call I call BS. Uh, ACC needs to investigate this. Uh, UVA needs to go on probation and be whatever. Like that sanctions need to happen because the fact that Jay Huff is still dominating people on the floor, I've seen him get retired, and I need that to be made official because that was two years ago, and he's still playing, and now he's going to be tormenting us on Saturday. This is something that we, we shouldn't be standing for. I think that Jay Huff's performance this weekend is going to be, is going to be what dictates whether Duke is able to win this game. If Duke can limit Jay Huff a little bit, that is going to go a long way in Duke being able to upset Virginia. The other two starters that I want to just quickly mention, they've got a, a second transfer, Trey Murphy, who is also a Durham native, but he's, he's transferring in from Rice, uh, six, nine guy and can also really shoot it. From three, he's hitting over forty percent of his yeah, the dude's three point the dude's attempts. Named, he's named Trey. Of course, he can shoot. He's named Trey. <laughs> yeah. So, so he's a great shooter from outside. And actually, this is another guy that Duke is going to have a problem with because I said Sam Hauser six eight and and is going to have Matthew Hurt on him probably. Trey Murphy is six nine and is shooting from outside. So Wendell Moore is going to be guarding him and is going to be giving up a few inches. I think maybe you'll see more Jamin Breakfield in this game to try to to try to limit. The fact that UVA has more size and this will be a huge game for Breakfield to have to have another great performance now that Jalen Johnson's not coming back. So that's going to be a challenge for Duke. And then finally, they've got a freshman, uh, Reese Beekman, who's the other guard on this team. He's a four star. He's been playing pretty well this season. He's not he's not a standout player yet for UVA, but I am sure that Reese Beekman is going to be tormenting Duke fans for the next couple of years. UVA actually had one other big time recruit, uh, Jabari Abdur Rahim, who has not played much this year. Um, I, I think he was a five star, like borderline five star type guy. And so we haven't seen a lot of him 
Um, maybe it's just taking him longer. He's a big man. So it might just be taking him longer to, to emerge in college basketball, but I'm sure we're going to come back next season. He's going to be averaging 18 and seven and, and everyone's going to hate him. So uh, Learn, hey, look, learning, for, look, learn, look for all of that. Learning the pack line defense is not an easy thing to do. It is uh, Virginia. I think more so than any other team, it takes time. It takes a, a good season, if not more than that, to be able to play the way they play defense. And so it's very tough for freshmen to have an immediate impact there. There's a reason why this Virginia team is loaded with seniors and juniors and guys who redshirted and all the other kind of stuff, because uh, you, you've, you've got to learn how to play the type of defense they play. And once they learn it, they're damn good at it. And in going back to Donald's point about how they had a shaky start to the season, the, you know, in, in this starting rotation, you've got two transfers and a freshman. Obviously those two, those two transfers come with a lot of experience, five years of college basketball between them before the season. And Sam Hauser, of course, coming from a, from a big time program in Marquette, but it does take time as, as Jason said, to, to learn these things. It seems like the last game aside, UVA has, has pretty well rounded into form and they are chasing a, you know, they have like an outside shot at getting a number one seed more likely. They're probably a two or a three in this tournament, but, but UVA is a very good team this year. So Duke's going to have its hands full. Uh, We're all looking forward to watching that game this weekend and seeing how it turns out. This would be an enormous win for Duke if they're able to pull it off. Yeah. One, one last little thing about this game. Duke has two really impressive wins under our belt, but they are both against teams at the bottom tier of the ACC. This game is the game that determines whether or not Duke is truly back, is truly a team to be feared in the NCAA, a team that is an NCAA contender. You don't want to put too much on one game, but I'll put a lot on this one game. If Duke loses to Virginia, then these past two wins are just, yeah, Duke beat up on teams in the bottom half of the ACC. Beat Virginia, and suddenly Duke is a team that everyone in the country is talking about, everyone in the country is worried about, and we are back in the NCAA conversation. That's how important this game is. I believe it's the most important game of the season thus far. And they will talk about the fact that, you know, how a lot of times they take the full breadth of work. We've had some instances in the past where we've had key players that were out for most of the season, and then they come back and they go, hey, you know, Kyrie's back. They're playing really well. They, you know, and it helps us in our seeding. It helps us in, in them determining what type of team they expect to see in the NCAA tournament. So with, with Jalen Johnson gone, this is a big test for us only because the selection committee will say, hey, not only did they beat Virginia, but they did it without who we thought to this point was their, was one of their best players. Maybe this Duke team is better than we thought they were. And that will help elevate them in the conversation. So We will be back with you after Duke plays Virginia, win or lose. We are certainly still following the Jalen Johnson story as it unfolds. And and if we hear anything more, we'll share it with you and discuss it here. But until then, stay in touch with us, dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Rate and review, five stars. We like those anywhere you listen to podcasts. For Jason Evans and for Donald Wine, I am Sam Klein. This has been episode 283 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We'll be back with you very soon again. Duke Band, take us home. give you a big Labor Day surprise. Most people think if we all exercise the same and eat the same, we'd all look the same. And let me tell you why that's wrong. Your body is unique and your metabolism is unique. I'm Lacey Green and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you can't see me, but I don't look like your average personal trainer. I'm curvy and I'm proud of it. So I created a program for beginners only on the Body app to show people like us how to get incredible results and be our version of happy and healthy. This isn't just workout videos. It's people like you and me. It's community. It's incredible trainers. It's easy to follow nutrition and mindset experts to help you reduce stress and just feel better. And you can get started with my new program called For Beginners Only. Now, here's the big surprise. If you go to body.com right now, that's B-O-D-I.com, not only can you get everything Body has to offer at 50% off with an annual membership, you'll also get an additional 20% off, but only during Labor Day weekend. Let's do this together. Go to body.com. That's body with an I.com.